Facebook is buying back 50 billion of their stock and dividing out billions of their stock. Apple is buying back their stock and dividing out their stock. Scratch your head and think about this a second. I'm going to apply this to Harvard and MIT. Give back the endowment and just raise the cost of the tuition 20% a year and stack twice as many students per class. And that's how you fix the university. How about this is an idea for your family? I want you to take all the money your family has. I want you to give it away to charity. And I just want you to tell your, your wife, your husband, your kids just to work harder and ask for a 15% raise next year. Michael Saylor draws a stark comparison between personal financial advice that sounds absurd and the actual strategies employed by corporations to sustain growth. By highlighting the repurchase of stocks by giants like Facebook and Apple, Saylor questions the sustainability of scaling operations and tuition fees as a model for growth in education and business. The absurdity of expecting families to relinquish their wealth for minor income increases underlines the flawed logic in expecting companies to thrive by merely working harder in an inflating economy. This approach, as Saylor notes, leads to a staggering failure rate among corporations with a lifespan shorter than a decade. Yet, institutions like Harvard, Oxford, and Yale defy these odds without significantly altering their operational models over centuries. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and give us a like to stay on top of the transformative world of digital finance. We keep expanding the currency supply by 10%, which means the price of everything you want to buy goes up by 10%, which means you have to grow your cash flows by 10%. And that's why the Magnificent Seven generate all the returns in the S&P 500. And there are 493 companies that return nothing, zero, right? There is, they can't, and by the way, it's not their fault, right? We blame them. We blame the companies like we blame the workers for not working harder. It's not their fault. You cannot outwork inflation. If, and we're back to this issue of if the person that runs the currency or the money printer just keeps printing 20% more money or 10% more money a year, you just stop the heart. Uh, you, you basically create a heart attack for every worker in the economy. And so my advice to anybody who's a CEO is... Don't work harder, work smarter, but really you're in a rowboat, you're trying to row, the wind is blowing, get yourself a sail, put the sail up and let the wind blow you instead of trying to row across the Atlantic, you're not going to make it. I mean, how many people in the room have a business they think they can grow 20% a year every year for the next decade without taking any more capital, without a capital investment, without hiring another person? <laughs> without taking competitive risk. Like, uh, if you're honest with yourself, no one's sure they can do that. There's like seven companies that have done it. Google, Facebook, Amazon. We know their names because for every one of them succeeded, 10,000 companies failed. It is uh, statistically very difficult. But on the other hand, so, so when you invest in Bitcoin, it's probably the least risky thing you're doing. But I'm not telling you, by the way, the big idea is not just take every last penny and buy Bitcoin. The real big idea is that they're venture capitalists like SoftBank with 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion. Their problem is they need to invest the money, right? They need to invest the money. They need a, and you, they need a use of proceeds. <laughs> and Bitcoin is the world's greatest use of proceeds because it's a creative, it beats the cost of capital. Right. And, and name a nut, you know, sovereign debt does not beat the cost of capital. Cash does not beat the cost of capital. You can't, by the way, you can't do this with art. You can't do it with real estate. I mean, the closest thing would be I'm going to raise billions of dollars. I'm going to buy high quality real estate. And so that's a real estate development thing, but that's a 20th century idea. And we're in the 21st century and you need to think about cyber real estate. The relentless expansion of currency supply paints a grim picture for the financial stability of both corporations and individuals. As Saylor points out, the artificial inflation of currency value necessitates a corresponding increase in cash flows just to maintain purchasing power. This system disproportionately benefits a minuscule fraction of companies, leaving the vast majority to flounder without real growth. But is working harder the solution? Saylor argues against this notion. 
advocating for working smarter by leveraging financial tools that can outpace inflation. Bitcoin emerges as a beacon of hope in this scenario, offering a tangible asset that appreciates over time, unlike traditional currencies plagued by inflation. The emphasis on Bitcoin as not just a speculative investment, but a strategic asset for companies, highlights a profound shift towards digital assets. Saylor's analogy of using a sail instead of rowing against the economic winds illustrates the need for innovative financial strategies in today's volatile economy. Bitcoin's digital currency, I think, is digital property. But uh, an example of digital currency is Tether or USD or Euros or CNY moving on a, on a digital device. Um, governments, as long as there's an effective government and they have power, they're going to designate legal tender. And currency is a system of control as well as a medium of exchange. And so govern it's going to be a very political issue, very controversial. There'll be lots of politics in, in an authoritarian government. They will use a digital currency as a system of control. In the U.S., there's a massive fight on Capitol Hill over whether or not there should be a digital currency. And people that believe in freedom and, and, and the like, they're going to fight it and, and do their best to stop it. Um, I think that you'll see that debate in every country in the world. It'll continue and it'll be layered in with another debate, which is, for example, um, if the, the people that love the digital dollar in the form of Tether are actually the Argentines, the one a medium of exchange. So, so the, do, the, the positive of a digital currency for the United States is if the U.S. actually mandated a digital currency, the dollar would collapse and replace every other currency in the world, including it'll, it would metastasize through Russia, through China, through, through all of our enemies and our friends. And you would have allies of America complaining that their local currency collapsed and you would have, have enemies of America not liking that. So, so it can be used as a tool to spread, to, to make a certain currency um, a reserve currency. And if you, want, if you want the U.S. dollar to remain the world's reserve currency, you would actually argue in favor of a digital currency because why wouldn't you want China to run on the dollar if you could get it to work that way? But, you know, equally, there's the issue of who controls it. Are you going to have a private corporation issue it running on a crypto rail or are you going to have a government issue it running on a state controlled banking rail? Look, I, I don't have the answer. It's very controversial. I do think that the future of digital currencies in the U.S. will probably be influenced heavily by the November elections and by the next administration. What makes Bitcoin special is it, it had an immaculate conception. Look, there, there's a fundamental, a very acid test. Is it a commodity or is it a security? If a crypto asset is a commodity, that means it's an asset without an issuer. If it's going to be a commodity, it means no person, no company, no government, no group of people can exercise undue influence over the future of the protocol. Mm -hmm. If there was a Satoshi alive speaking, tweeting today, and Satoshi said, I think we should change this part of the protocol, that would be an awful, awful fact. It would be, it would undermine the integrity of the network. There's the guy that invented gold is not tweeting that he wants to change the atomic characteristics of gold and the density of gold. That's why it's actually a commodity. And so it's, I think Bitcoin is unique in that it had an immaculate conception. Satoshi's gone, walked away, and the thing didn't even monetize until Pizza Day 18 months later. And uh, I think that it can't be ethical it can't, it can't be ethical money and global money unless it's a commodity. It's easy to create a security. You can create a million securities. You could spin them up in three hours. It's hard to create a commodity because the, the, the miracle of Bitcoin was we release something to the hobbyist that's worthless. And then on pizza day, a year and a half later, someone wants to pay a fraction of a penny for it and it spontaneously monetizes. That's never happened in the history of the world. It may never happen again. And uh, Satoshi is, is not necessary, it's not relevant, and it's an open source protocol. Read the code, right? And, and decide for yourself whether you trust it. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto. 
Don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you found our discussion enlightening. Together, let's keep exploring the future of finance, one digital asset at a time.